Hey everybody, welcome to Living the Line. I'm Carson Gruba, I'm the art instructor at Shelton State Community College and the artist of a book that this man is publishing. Hi, I'm Sean Robinson and uh, I am the publisher of uh, Living the Line and uh, Carson and I uh, have been doing a lot of stuff together uh, the past couple months. Uh, and including prepping a book for you called The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, which is uh, going to be coming out in uh, August. Here is our previews listing. Uh, you've got until the 28th, I believe, to order it from your local comic store. And uh, after which, hopefully, it will be available in uh, comic stores and bookstores nationwide. And if you need to, if you miss the 28th date, then you can you should be able to get it off of Amazon.com forevermore. Well, I shouldn't promise forever. <laughs> we hope forevermore. Uh, but we have an yeah. infinite print run. It's a really special print run you can get when uh, people like you a lot and uh, the books <laughs> just generate. Yeah, yeah, that's what we hope for. So um, that book's coming out. It's a it's a book. It's mostly. Um, by legendary Dave Sim, and I got lucky, and when his, his hand gave out, I got to take over the art, and then also was gifted the ability to finish up finish up the ending of the book. Um, so it's a heck of a book, and we hope you guys check it out. Anyways, we're going to go ahead and talk about other people's books now. So today we have, oh, we got a we got to do the alt in trick. There we go. Hey, <laughs> we have the swamp. I'll let Sean uh, butcher the Japanese name. And then and Sean, I, tell us why you're so interested in talking about this book. Yeah, this is a, a long awaited book. Uh, this is a collection of short stories by the legendary Japanese cartoonist Yoshiharu Suge. And uh, we are going to be saying a lot of Japanese names today. And I hope that you will be patient with us as uh, we give it our best shot. And uh, Suge is a really interesting cartoonist, and um, he uh, has had very limited representation in English. Uh, he's had about two short stories uh, that have been previously available. One was published in uh, an Art Spiegelman, uh, published it in Raw in uh, 1986. It's a short story from the same time period um, called uh, Oda at the Electric Plate Factory, a really, really um, stunning it was like eight pages or something. I read that many, many years ago. It was a huge influence on me personally. Um, and uh, I've been waiting for more since then. And the only other thing that's available until fairly recently in English is a, um, another short story of his called Screw Style, um, which is a very heavy, uh, surrealistic uh, story that was available in the Comics Journal, uh, had a translation of it. Uh, for I think their 200th issue or 250th issue, something like that. But uh, this book is uh, the first or uh, the major collection of his short stories in English. And it starts with his work in 1965. Uh, you, said you, you said you wanted to say something about the cover too. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, we were talking about uh, covers uh, fairly recently. And uh, I thought this is a very interesting, this is a very characteristic of um, a... Um, a certain style uh, that was popularized by Mr. Chip Kidd uh, in the early 2000s, where you have a blow up of a single panel uh, from one of the stories inside. And uh, you've got, in this case, two color, um, flat color PMS coloring on top of it. Um, PMS being a Pantone matching system. So it's a Pantone uh, spot color on top of it. And uh, it's an interesting uh, style for a cover design. I've been thinking a lot about it recently, and I think that there's no coincidence that the time that this style uh, came into popularity, you think about like a vertical publishing, the Buddha uh, comics in the early yeah. 2000s. Uh, that's when comics started to be bought online. And if you think about how terrible most complicated covers read on a tiny little postage stamp sized uh, square, on a screen, you might get an idea maybe of why this this style uh, is popular. Uh, and that's my little pet theory anyway. Well, and it's something that we encountered with, with Strange Death of Alex Raymond cover and something I think part of the solution here too is these are books that are collecting artwork that's in black and white. 
And right. so you, you want to have like this representative of what's inside, same thing that we did on Strange Out of the Ox Raymond. Like, how do we represent this beautiful art that's on the inside? But if you just have a black and white image, it doesn't have that pop online. It doesn't have that pop on the shelf. You you want that that thing that's jumping out. And so I've seen a lot of this where you pick like a single color and just overlay it over the black and white art. And then, yeah, the band or something like that, that has right. the title. So I think it's also a solution to making a black and white art look good, especially a piece like this, where if you see the original panel, there's a lot of white in it. There's not a lot of like black versus white contrast. So if, if you just saw it in a store, I don't know, it wouldn't, yeah, that back cover is really nice too. Yeah. So I think that's part of the solution is how do you get black and white to look good on a cover without going in and doing like modern day Photoshop coloring where, you know, like you're actually making a colored image because then that's a lie about what's inside the book. You're not getting colored art. So I think right. this lets you have the color, but keeps the focus on look, this is black and white line art that we're talking about. Right. And uh, like a lot of the uh, uh, drawn and quarterly uh, manga, this is a fairly small uh, size and uh, you might expect that given that the artwork would have been drawn at a fairly small size uh, as well. Do you have an idea about the size? That's actually something. Because one thing that we're going to try and do with every one of these videos we do is then re-ink one panel that we like and then that like that will be a separate video to each video we'll do one video analyzing the book and one where we try and recreate the art and look and try and figure out the mindset of the artist you know some of the technical mindset of each artist um so i'm curious with this art when we're doing those recreations what size should we be doing it at because yeah. i'm used to the 11 by 17 i'm not sure what size manga is typically done at well it really de depends but this this era um it would have only been done only a little bit larger than the actual magazine size um and uh, i think part of that was just because the reproduction was uh you know not great uh like most american comics from the time period uh and the um so they had a sort of digest size magazine that would have been fairly small. Uh, and then you probably would the artist probably would have worked about 120% over the actual in print size. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, small, small, much smaller than the 10 by 15 active area that you would have on an 11 by 17 sheet of uh, illustration board. Okay. Yeah. That, that's something when we're reproducing art, that's always going to be important because it's hard to talk about what tools did they use to do this when you don't know what size it's at. Um, right. So that's always interesting to me, especially with the manga, because it, it does print smaller. I've always wondered that. Um, and something that I found out in trying to find original artwork for the mangas, because when we're looking at print quality and stuff, it's, it's helpful to have the original to see what's actually been lost. You can't really find that with the manga. They don't auction off and sell off their pages like the American artists. And I don't know about European artists, but um, yeah, really, the really, these really don't get rid of their artwork. So it's really hard to find pictures of originals. Um, so that information is just kind of lost on 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 us. Yeah, re really uncommon. Uh, and and in this era, um, and this book starts in 1965, but. Um, uh, he, he had been an artist in the book market previous to uh, getting into short stories for this for this um, magazine market. In the book market, um, the publishers never returned the originals. Uh, and so you would get uh, people would just mail in their pages and never expect uh, to see them again. And so um, you kind of, I kind of wonder if the sort of modern or, you know, mod modern um, serial manga approach of keeping all of your originals uh, might be a response to the fact that for decades you had stuff that just disappeared into the ether it's printed once and that's it um and so this art this art in this book may have just got thrown away or it's in some publisher vault somewhere or something right else. okay and, and uh, that would explain too why uh, it looks like only a handful of pages are likely or possibly from original art but maybe we can talk about that when we get to those pages yeah yeah for sure uh, yeah, so here's the table of contents. You can see that um, the published date of each of these stories is from August 1965 to December 1966. And I believe that all of these were published in uh, Garo magazine, which was a magazine uh, that was founded by Sampai Shirato, uh, who has uh, made uh, very 
expressive, interesting uh, comics about um, you know ninjas and feudal lords and um, class warfare in feudal Japan. Uh, really interesting stuff. And uh, interestingly enough, um, these first few stories in here are very influenced by Senpai Shirato. Uh, and so you have um, uh, the beginning of the book uh, very strongly influenced by him. And then this middle section uh, of the book, a lot more characteristic of his uh, later stories instead, uh, Suge's later stories. And then the last section of the book, interestingly enough, um, features redrawn uh, stories that he had published in the book market. Um, but he, at this point, was looking for something else to do and uh, was encouraged to do that by one of his editors and um, went ahead and went, went back to the well and uh, adapted some of his previous uh, stories. And uh, so uh, if Drawn and Quarterly hopefully continues this series, you're gonna see a lot of things that are more similar to uh, this middle period of the book. So what are we starting with here, Carson? Uh, the phony warrior, and we've got on screen too. You sent me over the Sampai Shirato scan, so let me know when you want me to pull. Yeah, up. go ahead and pop that up now. It's, yeah, so these first ones are really, really influenced by Sampai Shirato, even down to the line work, the character design, and the settings. Uh, and I noticed something. It's going to override our little book views here. Okay. Um, but this something I noticed. Something I noticed a lot in Suge's work is. Uh, him getting better and better at tracking motion yeah and as as soon as i opened this up i thought oh there it is like that's that's the him running up and down the um the tree that I, i'm so interested in so and even there's the, some of the senpai shirato and look at that bouncy line there and all of the uh, uh, like you said uh, uh emphasis on motion uh and that and the character designs are the things that we uh, he really carries over, his influence carries over into Suge's. Yeah, you um, see that in the later work in the book too. Right. So even the ones those up, and we can come back to them. Great. Yeah. So, you... so these these early ones start out, uh, and this is what I found surprising about the book, is it is a bunch of short stories, but it's a kind of an uneven read because he goes from these samurai stories which i also found like the, these type of panels very odd i'm not used to seeing um, pages that are this dense in a manga there's other stuff oh here's the already here's the him um the motion that same thing of like the running up and down and the flipping that's there on page 19 but in this one it's it's very confusing like like this guy's headed off this way and i know i'm supposed to read down to here but there's a lot of motion this way and then this guy's flipping up but then there's motion this way and we'll see later in the book i was really interested in a page where the use of motion is much better i don't want to flip through and get all confusing but we'll get back to that so th the motion here just doesn't lead through the page very well but looking at these senpai shirato i see that same jumpy loopy mm -hmm. thing we'll flip back to the yeah you got to wonder if he uh was having some uh if suge in some of these early ones was having some adjustment time uh getting used to uh having a more limited uh amount of space to work with uh you know because his previous works had been directed to the book market where um, you could decompress as much as you want. He could draw as many pages as he want. There's just an endless void of pages to be filled, as opposed to when he was contributing to Garrow, and he's you know being asked to be one short story contributor to a larger uh, publication, monthly publication. Yeah, so you get those dense panel arrangements, and I don't think he's handling like this. There, compositionally throughout the whole page, there's a nice flow where I kind of come in and I, I read this and then I flow down into there, um, you know, going back to going back to the page at hand. It's just the flow of all that's very confusing to me. And there are like, I, th this is something that was surprising to me. I'm just not used to seeing manga this dense. I'm not used to seeing that much dialogue. I'm not used to seeing all of this like internal captioning 
or right. like storytelling. It's, it's, I don't know, that, that was all just unique to me. Um, but I do feel like in this, these early two stories, um, here's another example of where I feel like he just hasn't got his chops totally together in terms of um, how to move an eye through a page. Like, again, I know I'm supposed to read right to left. So I'm tempted, but then there's all this, this weird structure here through the middle where I'm almost tempted to read this way. Right. But you are supposed to read this way. And I could see that it flows back down. But th this like just line leading over here too. Like he's looking down, his tongue is down. I lead through the line and then it right. comes into this watermelon, which is literally like a weight. And I, I can almost like visually skip those. So his abstract ability to compose, like here you have this beautifully composed picture in the abstract. Wonderful. And that's something I, I really like later on in the book is his sensor. Uh, it looks to me like he's influenced by Western and European um, abstract expressionism and like like everything that was going on in Europe with abstraction in that time. I see that in this, but here it doesn't work. I, I, I'm like almost ignoring these or I get confused. So I do see like a guy figuring stuff out in these early stories and they seem stock humorous stories to me. Right. Like if I have to critique this, the, just the stories. When when we get to this one, um, it's still a samurai story, but it takes a more personal bent. And I feel like that was a kind of a transition into the stories that follow, which all of a sudden <laughs> go like way haywire. Um, uh, there's not anything particularly interesting to me in that story. I mean, there, his some of his rendering, I think, is getting better. Like this piece is really nice. I mean, he always has these really nice single images, but I think his total page compositions get better. Um, and then starting, this is another samurai story, but I, this one I think got um, way more interesting. Yeah, there's and a lot more this one really shows me the interest in abstract painting because it's about a painting. Um, and there's, there's a lot of ambiguity in it too. There's a, it's a out of luck samurai who finds a scroll and he becomes convinced uh, when drunk uh, significantly enough uh, that the scroll is a map instead. And so he follows the natural progression of this, uh, of this map and ends up finding an artist on the edge of town who laughs at him for thinking it was a map and confesses to have painted it himself. And um, well, of course, the contradiction being that he it is a map in the sense that he used it to get to the place that he's at um and uh if i remember correctly they both get drunk together uh. yeah yeah <laughs> but there's there's something about this that that looks like uh like a loose version of maybe a mondrian right i'll pull up i mean i'm assuming most people know Piet mondrian but uh well, you have a visual you like a yeah i'm gonna get it, it's all just flat shapes on a canvas which to me i just don't i mean maybe i'm just not informed enough but i don't associate that with japanese art but you get a uh, mondrian i mean here's some very typical um piet mondrians and this is like the height of western modernism where you're trying to get uh, the paintings to be completely non-representational you know, they're not supposed to reference anything. They're just supposed to be shape for the sake of shape. But you do have late Mondrians, like this is called, like mostly you would have a Mondrian like this and he would just call it composition number 38 or whatever. Cause he's purposely saying, you know, it's not a picture of anything. It's just, we're using the basic elements of art, uh, black and white line and shape, and then the primary colors. Uh, in late Mondrian, you get where he's applying those ideas to he, he had moved to New York and loosened up a little bit. And so you get Broadway boogie woogie, but it's that same thing in this story um, of the painting in the Suge book is it's this abstract representation that he's able to use like a map. So I find right. I found that totally fascinating in this book. Yeah, you've got you've got a drunk guy who uh, is is um, basically slipped from abstraction into non representation. And that slip uh, brings him to the person who made it in the first place. 
uh, and then they can briefly engage with each other. Yeah, I scribbled a bunch of nonsense. I scribbled a bunch of nonsense, then I threw it away. Yeah, the map the artist says. And you see his other works in the studio are more typical of what I associate with Asian abstraction. Um, I don't know, maybe that's a deeper conversation to get into, but I associate Western abstraction with icons. You're trying to distill down to the iconic essence of a thing. So you're trying to get down to, um, maybe I can show that on screen too, while we're talking about it, <laughs> since it's coming up. But I would say like uh, Twitter, is a perfect example of like a Western icon. It's just representing bird. There's nothing specific about it. It's iconic. But if you get an Eastern, like um, I'm trying to think of an artist off the top of my head. Let's just say Japanese ink drawing bird. There's a fair amount of abstraction to it, but they're more specific to the actual um, object in front of This is perfect right here. Okay, super abstract still, but there's not that iconic thing. It's still a very specific bird that they were looking at. So they're capturing the essence of like the specific object rather than the icon that represents the group. Um, that's to me a pretty distinct difference between the, the Western way of abstraction and the Eastern way of abstraction, iconic versus um, essence of a particular thing. And so it's interesting in this panel you have that standard essential abstraction rather than the iconic abstraction or, and then, then this painting is towards that iconic, totally non-representational type of stuff. So well, it, I don't know how aware he is of all of that, but he seems influenced to me by. Well, that, that ambiguity is still in the story as well, of course, because the, the fact of it is that they don't arrive he, you know, he's arrived at the place, but it's not a, intended to be a map. Um, yeah, and that's more Eastern again. That's like right. that contradiction that would never fly in Western thought, but in and, Buddhist thought that self-contradicting is like the whole game. <laughs> and, and, and similarly, uh, his samurai story, his uh, genre samurai story has turned into something a little bit more personal or more, um, you know, a very different kind of thing with like switch modes yeah and then, and then with the next story the switch. swamp he, he goes off the rails into totally dark we were talking Personal about this bizarre territory talking about this uh, image before uh, as possibly one of the few that um is either sourced from original art or has been retoned uh, digitally uh, as opposed to the majority of the artwork in the book, which looks as though it's been um, reproduced from a printed copy and sometimes um, from a poorly printed copy um, because yeah. presumably the artwork isn't around. And to let's take again. a closer, closer look at that as well. <clears throat> um, I'll keep that Shirato up. So here we have the second page of the swamp and we we scan this in out of the book at 1200 dots per inch um there's there's a couple things i notice and i even notice it on the title page of the swamp even though the tone's more even the lines look very filled in and gummed up they look thicker than they probably are in the original art congested um, yeah so i wanted to look at well, first off, we can look at the tone. Like if you look at the tone pattern here, it's very uneven. And I don't know if that's intentional. We have another panel where we're going to talk about erasing the tone. So I don't know if some of that's intentional to try and make the swamp look more foggy. I think it kind of works. But then if you look at the title page, it's a perfectly even tone like you see here in the title page to the un unusual painting. And on this one, this looks like it's, yeah, either been fixed up or it's shot from the original art because it's very well preserved, right? Right. And you can see that, um, you know, crisp areas between the hatching and other things that are, you know, would have filled in in a multi-generational copy. You can see that the, the dots actually look like circles as opposed to that uh, swamp image. 
uh, that's this is very typical of what happens when uh, you have fine tone reproduced and then reproduced again and each time that you're you're asking an optical system whether it's a camera or a scanner to look at something so fine like that um, a certain percentage of that burns off due to the optical system's resolving power and um, that includes paper itself so just you know the actual initial impression um, didn't get a completely smooth uh, surface to it, both because of the paper and the way that the image is transferred and everything like that. But yeah, like the, it's interesting. If you look in some of the areas of cross hatching there, you could anticipate that the original would have had a lot less fill in. Not only would those lines have been thinner, uh, you would have had uh, a lot more detail within those uh, shadowed areas. And, so uh, I wanted to look at then because we're used to seeing this, but I don't think people understand. Like we have this language that you understand when I say gummed up or filled right. in, you know what it means. So here's a panel out of out of another story in the book that to our eyes looks a lot cleaner. It looks more like it was shot from the original art or closer to the original art, right? right. Possibly from a negative. And there's still... I would, I, it's hard to tell because, and this yeah. is where it's a bummer to not be able to see the original art. It, you know, there could be some fill in still, like these lines could be thicker. I would say there's definitely some loss on the thinner lines. It yeah, looks like, like I don't think he was skipping his pen there. It's just got thin yeah. and it, it evened out, right? But right. I thought this would be a good example to show people what we're talking about. Um, I think I can kind of recreate the effect just by messing with the levels. So right. there's, there's two problems, and Sean, you're better at this than I am, so correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're reproducing artwork that has fine lines like this and big, thick areas of black, there's two ways you can go. If you're trying to capture the thin lines, um, you might need to lighten things up. Is that correct? Yeah, that would be correct if you're doing it just photographically and your exposure is essentially the only thing you have control over, yeah. And you're so you're you're like exposing the lighter stuff, but then you'll see that the blacks wash out a little bit. Um, they get grainy looking and up in the dot tone. You start breaking up all of the the fine areas. Yeah, they don't they don't hold the dots anymore versus that where they're very much like dots. So when you're trying to get the thin stuff, you could err on that side, but then you get this broken up image. If you're trying to preserve some of that stuff or preserve the darkness, then you would adjust the blacks, but you can see, let's go to an area with like some hatching. These areas here, the lines will get thicker and get closer together. The white in between them gets smaller. And that's what I mean when I say gummed up. Yeah. Like, and you'll see a lot of, a lot of these prints of old things have that fuzzy gummed up look like that. Right. versus that crisp look like that um and 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 uh with really careful photography um or with uh, modern digital techniques uh you can get everything uh but it, it's about having a very sharp optical system um you know a really fantastic desktop scanner can now do what a, a camera the size of your room uh, had to do before um so you know we've come a long way but um uh, people still sort of think about those old methods and don't realize that we have a tremendous amount of uh, resolving power these days with a really fantastic scanner um, and with the modern, you know, plate technology. And this, uh, this also shows when we get up close what you're talking about with the paper, some of just the warp in the paper becomes texture that could be picked up and right. especially in these areas could cause noise and then those dot patterns get ugly and sticky and over time you're you're kind of having one exposure that's like this one exposure that's like this and you you know one of them that's thicker one of them that's thinner and over time that i'm, I'm assuming that's what you're saying is going on with an image like this that's that, right that that variation can eventually cause that to go you know blank blank out areas and yeah with fine tone you get a few generations down and that's that's the inevitable uh, result, but um, but yeah, the so, story. 
it's so, it's it's too it's too bad because that is where his stories take a much more interesting turn. Yeah, so this is the swamp, um, and uh, it 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 has uh, the the title story um, has a very interesting um, combination, I would say. Once again, like the simil the previous one of genre elements and personal elements, you have a hunter walking through the woods who finds a uh, beautiful but presumably disturbed woman who is rings the neck of a uh, goose that he's shot um gives him the head <laughs> and uh what a charm <laughs> he stays in her in her house at night and uh she lets him know uh, that there's a snake that she keeps in a room in a box as you do and that the snake comes out at night and chokes her and it feels really good. In a box that like the snake can easily get out of. The snake, <laughs> the snake chooses to be in there. You keep a snake in a bird cage? Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh yeah, he's fine. He, he, he'll come out and he'll choke me every now and then. Does the and... snake crawl out at night? He sure does. Sometimes he come and strangles me. <laughs> what? Because I get so lonely. She's so lonely. And um, he wakes up in the middle of the night and uh, significantly has the eyes that she had in the earlier scene. And um, he strangles her, not to death, um, but uh, that's what he does. And then he wakes up with the sun and leaves, finds that she's not there in the bedroll and he takes off and um, uh, she is arguing with her husband or her boyfriend and it has this kind of stillness that to me really feels significant he really lets you just sit in the moment this panel here where he's putting his cap adjusting his cap as he walks away and the husband's saying you just do whatever you want don't you yeah, and he's like, yeah, whatever. I just strangled your woman last night in a slightly erotic way. <laughs> like a snake. Yeah, walks like off and fires his gun. Yeah, and this is, yeah, this is like, that's not phallic <laughs> at all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's but just it's, bleak. This is where it veers into like something more personal. And it's very, it, it veers from the the samurai comedy to... I don't know the history of manga enough to know what the precedent for horror is, but this is pretty early on. It, it starts moving towards the, the horror stuff, but without being terribly grotesque. Um, something else, we talked about this earlier, and you, you had talked about the transition of her eyes to his eyes. When I read that, I did not notice that at all. And when I took a closer look, I realized because the print quality is gummed up right. on here. Yep. I didn't notice that effect in her eyes. I just thought that that was them doing like hatching in her eyes. Um, and then you have some where her eyes are clear, but there's this effect that's in her eyes that it, it just doesn't reproduce well enough. And then you get it uh, in his eyes a little bit when he's thinking about choking her. But then definitely when he, he walked away is the only time I really noticed that in the eyes, like you were talking about. When you have a close-up, yeah. And I realized, I thought, okay, I was just being a sloppy reader. But part of that is just that stuff didn't show up because of that, that issue we're talking about, about the resolve of the camera. So it's not just like, I think people could get the impression when they're watching this channel that me and you have like really just... <laughs> worked our way down into this hole of this stuff and we're like one of 10 guys that are out there that are irritated by this and we're trying to get everyone else irritated so that we can be irritated which is like probably part of it but this is a perfect example of it really made a difference to my understanding of the story like i i, I missed something because the artwork wasn't uh, right where he intended it to be um, yeah so I, I was actually glad because it's like well this is the perfect like first video for us after the strange death of Alex Raymond one, because this is why this stuff matters. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's a it, it's nice ambiguity uh, to this story too. Like you said, horror elements, but they're all like maybe subsurface horror elements. And so you, as a reader, are making the choice whether or not 
you are engaging with this as a story about three people in the woods or whether there's some kind of transference of a malignant spirit or something or whether both things are literally true and whether or not people doing violence to each other is a transference of malignant spirit in yeah. other words you don't have to you don't have to have a, a firm conclusion uh in order for it to be significant for you and i think his best stories and uh, oda at the electroplate factory and uh, screw style are both like that his best stories have that kind of ambiguity they're just daring you to take both sides <laughs> and, and map your own interpretation right. onto it yeah and that's where i felt like this I, I get why Drawn and Quarterly is publishing this. It seems, I'm not used to seeing this kind of short story stuff in manga. Um, these very brief things, I'm used to the series that run on forever. And so I get why they're the ones bringing this because it feels like what some of their artists do or the anthologies they do where they get a bunch of eight page stories and they are more personal, ambiguous stories. Um, so yeah, that, that makes more sense. And it's interesting to see his kind of progression towards that throughout the book. It felt a little uneven at first, but the more I think about it, it's I'm getting a picture of an artist developing. So this is one of your favorite ones, right, Chirpy? Yeah, I would say this is probably uh, probably my favorite of the volume. Uh, and uh, you, it, it's interesting you say the autobiographical or, you know, slice of life. And this, you know, we literally are seeing a cartoonist making a comic. Um, on the on the page as we're looking yeah and i'll admit personally i and i, I just strange death of alex raymond is a book about cartoonists making a book about cartoonists making books <laughs> <laughs> um and i i'm not so comfortable with that because it's become one of my least favorite type of comics is the autobiographical memoir of a comic artist struggling with being a comic artist and how shitty it is to be a comic artist right I'm kind of sick of that genre. Like, if you fucking hate it so much, then quit doing it. You know, like, I don't want to read about it. Your life's not that bad. Um, yeah, so I like that this has that element. And it could be maybe this is something that he kind of went through in his own life. He's talking about being an artist. But it's not about being an artist. That's just something that happens right. to be part of it. Uh, also, that that particular genre was unheard of in 1965. Um, yeah, and, God uh, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, the artist uh, and his uh, girlfriend are living a fairly unhappy, unfulfilled existence, and she works at like a pachinko parlor or some type of entertainment hostess, and uh, is having problems with her work. And they definitely seem like they have some kind of void that they need filled and she has decided that she wants to buy a bird and that they're going to raise they are. <laughs> a bird right see how cute they are we'll just put it in a cardboard box for now that works just put a light bulb in the lid and sure enough even though they continue to still have these problems um it seems to have filled some kind of void and by the time i hit about the midway point that's when i started feeling a uh uh a feeling of um encroaching doom <laughs> Disease, yeah yes. and that's that's actually this page here where you start to get the doom this is another one of those ones that you sent to me where you saw the, the there, there was this was a group of guys that were working together is that correct yeah um so so um uh Suge was was a contemporary in the book market of a slightly older gentleman named uh, Yoshihira Tatsumi, who um, had coined the the phrase Gekiga and had made a lot of similarly um, toned stories, both in the 50s with the sort of uh, hard edge crime comics and then later in the 60s with more personal stories. This is a collection that Drawn and Quarterly uh, published of uh, his short stories from 1969. So a few years after this uh, Suge one, but uh, this particular image really um, brought to mind uh, certain uh, Yoshihira Tatsumi panels. It's almost a motif in uh, Tatsumi's work. Uh, so here's a scan of that page. And I actually think the whole page has that motif that you're talking about. Yeah, right? 
Absolutely. He's waiting for his uh, girlfriend, the hostess, uh, for a long time at the subway station. And uh, you have a strong visual demarcation between him and the crowd. Uh, in this case, the of the first panel, he's literally separated them by them between him and the I beam there, but he's also separated by the rendering and that they are all facing another direction away from him and they're all pushed back by being in that black morass. And, and you uh, see a uh, parallel to what's yeah, happening this, in this page from Pushman. Yeah, this is a short Tatsumi's short story from 1969. And uh, especially that bottom panel there or the progression from the middle to the bottom panel, you see him literally moving against a sea of faces. Everyone else is going the other direction and he's in opposition to them. And that is, like I said, almost a motif in the Tatsumi short stories from that time period. You see that image over and over again of just everybody else as this almost like a sea and uh, him as being the the him being the uh, narrator being separated from them isolated from them worth remembering yeah. that japan was in a fairly horrendous uh, depression economic depression that last for lasted for more than a decade and uh, both tatsumi and uh, uh suge were in a really uh, uh, you know it, it was not a uh, it was not a good time economically and uh, you can sort of see some of that existence in a lot of these stories. And I think Chirpy <laughs> does a pretty good job of depicting, uh, you know, the downsides to that economic depression. Yeah, and what you'll do to try and uh, on that one, I don't think we should show the ending. Yeah, no, um, we'll, we'll hold off. But, um, it, but like kind of what people do to make themselves feel better in those situations. Um, and how that can go well and how it can go wrong <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh and, and yeah. his his abilities in, as an artist are an important part of important part of that as well so it's not just like uh it's not just like he's putting a manga artist in there because no. he's a manga artist it, it's important to the story you actually get some of his process in there too interestingly yeah. enough you, you see him ruling out the pages on the first um ruling out the pages previous to drawing anything it looks like um on the first page yeah and the pins that he's using which when we're doing recreations like uh, i wish we could always order the tools that they have yes yeah. that would be indicative. like we're gonna have to try and recreate some of this you you and i have talked about this type tools. of nib before but this the spoon uh nib here so it holds a whole a large reservoir and then it's slightly blunt uh, at the tip there so that you can get a lot of backstroke. You don't have to worry about directionality so much as you do with like a crook quill or a, a nib that's intended to be used for um, like litho lithographic work. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, it doesn't scritch against the uh, grain of the paper. Yeah. yeah. So he, he's ruling out the papers here. And then later, later sequence, you see him uh, roughing in an image. I don't want to give out the give away the whole thing, but uh, interesting to see his process incorporated into the uh, story. Yeah, and, and we'll have to try and get a hold of some of those pins, some pins that are like that. Uh, mushroom hunting is a real quick, real quick. This is an interesting one. Uh, so, so um, I didn't Suge... get this story at all. Oh, yeah. honest, I didn't know what the hell was going on in this one. Yeah, I don't know if it's really even so much of a story. Uh, <laughs> it's like a little, a little slice. But uh, interestingly, drawn in what might seem as a completely different style. That's uh, why I tagged that page. Actually, that's interesting. Yeah. Wait, that out too. So Suge was a uh, was an assistant or worked with um, uh, Shigeru Mizuki uh, for quite a while, and has has basically taken his Mizuki style and his job with uh, Mizuki and applied it to a very short story. Uh, very interesting essay in the back of the book that uh, discusses that somewhat. But here's a Mizuki book that um, Drawn and Quarterly uh, published uh, back in 2008. This is a fantastic book, unbelievable artwork. And um, you get an idea of uh, Mizuki's style from it, but super rubbery characters with um, complexly rendered uh, backgrounds and, uh, and mizuki, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at a different mizuki book for one right. of the next videos we do yeah and you can see that the the characters are very i That's mean perfect yeah flatter than um their surroundings 
in a very interesting and expressive uh, way. And uh, for a brief period of time, Suge uh, actually worked drawing some of those characters for Mizuki Pro, which was the I, name of the Mizuki's organization. I've already scanned some Mizuki stuff, actually. So here we can look at it on screen with that rubbery character that's... versus the super detailed background. I mean, that's why I pulled that one out, yeah. actually, for when we talk about Mizuki. Um, I noticed that in this story, though. That's why I had a, a tag on that page. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is, yeah, this character's that really thick lines and super rubbery. And again, I think some bad reproduction filled the eyes yeah. in more. But then this character, a little <laughs> bit less so, fits into the background better. And that's consistent throughout the story. This This kid just looks like... I mean, maybe it's intentional, but he looks super removed to me. Oh, yeah. He's just like a sticker on top of everything else. Right. The old man is more cartoony, but he integrates in into the background. Um, yeah, it definitely seems like a formal uh, trick or exploration. Yeah, and that it's, it's something I want to look at with other artists eventually. But me personally, and, and it's something that helped me with the strange death of Alex Raymond. And I'm interested in being a stylistic chameleon as an artist. And part of that is because I think style can function as symbol. Um, like if that's a symbol of that artist's, that, that style like packs in everything that goes with that artist's career. Uh, when you draw like them, you can import all of that knowledge about their career into your work. Um, and so I find that like a very powerful communicative tool. I don't know what he's doing with it in this story, but I do think I do think there is something along those lines where he's, I don't know, maybe if he looked at that guy as like a master of his. This, uh, absolutely. This has, this has like an old man, master, child. Right master and student kind of thing i don't know i but i i do think that's some of the content in this story is coming from the formal issues of the styles yeah no i i i think that that is a that is a very good way to look at it that he has literally borrowed um the face from this other um you know from this other place and uh, put it into his story uh and and it, it's it carries over into the next story too the second handbook um, he's, he's trying out that sort of, um, expressive flatness and bringing it into a little bit more of a three-dimensional, uh, environment with not quite the same contrast in terms of the line weight. Yeah. Sorry. My camera just crapped out there. I think it gets too hot. We'll try and get it back. You, you had some uh, some scans from this one that we might... I do have scans of that one. Yeah. yeah. That would be better anyways. Yeah, the camera. I think the camera got too hot. Needs to rest. Problem we're going to have to solve. Um, there are some scans from this one that I really like. This was one where I feel like his interest in motion became better. His interest in leading the eye around the page. Um, it's a story about a kid who finds some money and he has to make a choice about what to what to do whether to give the money back or whether to keep it and so pages like this i think are really compelling and again this goes back to that like western abstraction um like how how the shapes fit on the page so first off i think this piece here like if you take the kid out i understand it's a rail yard and stuff but it's it's almost abstract i just see it as shapes and lines that are very compelling sets of shapes and lines but then on top of that the page is set up to show i could go this way or this way like i know again i'm supposed to read this this and this but my overall first impression when i look at the page is i feel like i come up here and then i can go one of two ways so i found that very very interesting in terms of uh, formal use of panel layout and composition. Um, this as well, it's like, okay, we're gonna lead down here and then direct the eye back up to there. But it also has this abstract sense of like being propelled on a destiny and all of that, um, that, that I think is so much more sophisticated than stuff that he was doing. What, this is like less than a year apart? 
yeah it's yeah it's it's quite unbelievable but he's given himself more space too i mean this is a longer story um much less dense um but yeah that that image um you know it it's it's easy when to to dismiss cartoony work i think too um for some some people uh and think that the people are unsophisticated somehow for drawing that way uh but look at that first panel right there i mean from a graphic standpoint i just unbelievable use of value you you literally have like a four value system being created with minimal hatching and a single screen tone um i i love the fact that you've got a middle tone under that arrow and then you have an implied middle tone by the crosswalk um if you were to you know be 15 feet away from the page by this getting darker back here you're talking about exactly like, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and um, then, and then you have a, a that a, like a sort of transitional tone by all of that uh, grit on the sidewalk there, which is just I, I just love that right there. I mean, you talk about like post-war depression, that arrow pointing against him with all the dirt on the ground. But it just yeah, that's, kills that's me. a great it's a great page. And there's a couple other pages. I don't know. My camera has gone gone haywire here. I'm gonna try something else really quick it's not going to be as high resolution but that's okay um because there's a couple other pages in terms of graphic design that i wanted to talk about in that book Ooh, that is bright well give me just a second um sean if you could flip to page yeah. What page was it? That one with the really stark uh, page one twenty eight, with that really stark graphic. Oh uh, yeah, this is the one you were calling the Starenko, right? <laughs> yeah, or Frank Miller. That's just fantastic. Yeah, or Crepa. Crepa. Oh, <laughs> Crepax. Good old Crepax. Yeah, I don't know. He's someone else that I totally want to take a look at. I have a couple of his books and. Um, he's definitely someone we need to look at in terms of like rhythm on a page. Um, yeah, just me, just as a pure that. visual, forgetting the fact that this is communicating something and that this is a um, you know a part of a story. I mean, that's what is just what a fantastic visual. Uh, you got this cartoony kid in the in the foreground, and then just the totally abstracted woman's silhouette and her shadow in the back with the telephone pole. Um, yeah, and after pages and pages of these, like, you <laughs> have this on the previous page, like this super well rendered, and he's kind of like leading you into that. And then this one just hit me like, where the hell is this weird, like realistic silhouette thing coming from? Like, it just seems so different. So I love seeing him. He's experimenting with all of this, this stuff. I think this story is the one where he becomes really graphically sophisticated, like it it has that the T the T shaped page. Um, it has yeah, it has this one that we have the scan of. There's the T shaped page. Uh, it has those like Frank Miller type of pages to it. Uh, yeah, it's just this one he really he really takes off. And this after also after the bleakness of the previous few stories, um, I found this one to be soothing. <laughs> right from. from uh, a standpoint of the story standpoint um you had sent me a scan of this i don't know if there was something particular i was thinking about. that we would use that for our um well yeah let's go ahead and pop it up let's take a look at it we can we can talk about it when we ink it too but um yeah so what we're going to do then we're going to try and do this for every video i think is we'll look at the book we'll talk about the art we'll talk about the printing we'll talk about the formalisms of like how panels work together but then we both realized, especially because of working on Strange Death of Alex Raymond, where we've had to recreate artist styles, you can sit there and look at it in Photoshop all day. But once you start drawing over it in ink and trying to recreate it, you learn something else. So we thought it would be a great supplement to each video to do a second video where we'll print this out in blue line. And just to give people a sense of what that's going to look like, we might as well do that while yeah. we're here, right? Um, you do it as a fill layer? that's that's how i do it uh no, oh no okay interesting um i gotta get this into a right right now it's a 
uh, it's a black and white image. I'm going to get it to a colored image real quick. Um, I have a hue and saturation pre-adjusted. Uh, okay. And I oh, can great. just turn it. To, so I, I turned it to um, process cyan. And then we'll print it out. I usually lighten them up a little bit, which is why I put it on another layer because it prints out real dark. But me and Sean will print these out and basically re-ink them. If we think things are filled in, um, Right. Yeah, and the reason we're doing it on a blue line is because we can scan it back in and then it just drop the blue out and then we, we'd have the ink again. So we'll be able to show um, both of our versions, I guess would be cool. Mm -hmm. But uh, we could also say, you know, we don't know, but if we think lines got thicker and stuff, that was something I had to do with the Alex Raymond stuff. If I thought the reproduction was bad, I'd have to try and um, save the art a little bit, you know, like if I think it's getting a little gummed up in here, then I, I might try and save that. So it's an interesting part of the re-inking process. Uh, so yeah, this looks like a good one to re-ink. We won't do the dot tone patterns, but right. that'll be fun. Yeah, this this is a, another one of those images that is very loaded. And uh, it's interesting, most like abandoned kids toys can be a sort of a trite uh, thing, but this one doesn't feel trite to me at all. And part of it is that the the kid is walking to the left, and the the tricycle is is angled more up, more at like a twelve o'clock angle. But then the then the front of the wheel is turned him almost like it's regarding him, uh, yeah. like his dog or something. I mean, it just this just image just killed me uh, when I was looking at it. Uh, and it, you know, it, one of the things that's amazing about cartooning is that you can draw something that carries just as much weight as uh, hundreds of words. And um, this was just one that really made an impression on me. So I thought it'd be a fun one to yeah. redraw. It's a hell of an image. That that was actually, it's funny because when I was looking last night for ones to re recreate, that was the one I landed on too. <laughs> like, it's a nice image. It doesn't look like it would take us 10 hours. You know, some of them like right. some of them in this story here, are actually a strange letter. It's like, man, I'd love to draw those, but we'd be here all day. Yeah. Um, like that, that right there. You know, we're not going to redraw that. And this is the other one that looks like it was probably from original artwork. Uh, you can see there's some more fine line detail. And then the tone itself is much, much cleaner than anything else. Um, and uh, so this and two other pages are probably the only original artwork they had. The other possibility is that it's actually not original artwork and it was retoned or digitally toned after the fact i don't know for sure can't really tell um, but we'll yeah. look at you we have scans of those so there was there was this page this image in particular that looked like we thought looked really nice the tone looks really good and even um the lines look really good excepting like here where i said right. it looks like it they lost some of the smallest lines um the other reason we wanted to look at that is this is another one where you thought you saw the Tatsumi influence. Right. And it's hard to tell which direction that goes in because I don't have any uh, works on hand from Tatsumi from the same time period. But certainly Tatsumi's later 1960s stuff, which would have been, would have been just a few years later than this, um, very, very similar, both in terms of the rendering and in the subject matter. You have these really like gritty urban stories of workers, especially workers in industries or areas that are just you know very um i mean awful jobs <laughs> yeah ab absolutely terrible jobs um and uh also just the stylization of the characters this is a clearly a tatsumi influence and uh tatsumi's um 50s work which we do have some in print representations of also is very similar to it so i, I would say that this is a if it's not an homage it's at least aware of its influence um, and they were working together you said uh well no they i, I don't believe that okay. they ever worked together um but they were i mean 100 percent aware of each other um and uh i mean definitely aware of each other i don't know if they met uh or anything like that but um tatsumi uh yeah they they were they were contemporaries although tatsumi was a little bit older and this image I've got is a scan from a drawn quarterly publication. Yeah. This one's really nice. This looks like it's they got original art or a really good negative. Yeah, it's 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 possible. Um it, although it's hard to tell without seeing the um uh without seeing any, you know, tone 
you don't get as many cues as far as how much how much uh, thickness or degradation there was to the image. But uh, yeah, uh, this is a from the Drawn and Quarterly uh, publication, The Pushman, which I would definitely recommend. And uh, the sewer, this uh, gentleman is um, working a fairly heinous uh, job and finds a certain item inside of the sewer that um, he finds to be very disturbing. I'm gonna uh, have to get that book and we'll have to look at that one for sure. What, one of my favorite stories in there, my Hitler being the 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 best I mean, and possibly <laughs> the ultimate Tatsumi statement of negative. <laughs> anyway, yeah. this one is, is, is very similar to Tatsumi in terms of its sentiment as well. Um, a, a, a gentleman has had his, his mother perish and he gets a letter from a guy who works at the crematorium where his mother was at apologizing to him. And uh, it's quite, <laughs> quite bleak. <laughs> uh, something else that we were looking at in this panel, potentially um, yeah. comparing it to this one, where I, I wondered how much of this was intentional. Like, because when I, if I take away the fact that the lines in this one look too thick to me, right. um, that effect on the tones being uneven actually adds the swampy field to me. Yeah the title page didn't have that, but my initial instinct was that might be on purpose. Right. And here you see some of that. Yeah. That's, aid. that's tone, tone etching. And if this was indeed done on the original and not digitally after the fact, that would have been done with either a sand eraser, like an eraser that has some grit in there or an actual piece of sandpaper. And you just sort of lightly, mush at the the surface of the tone until you um, build up a, a little gradation there um and it's and, not and a... so people know that the tone at this point was a sticker it's like a sticker with the dots printed on it yeah and you you take it off uh you you stick it onto the paper you would cut out this area and peel you know stick the paper over the whole area and then cut out what you don't want it's a it off. And on a clear adhesive erase, yeah you can erase off there's ink like on the surface of that clear adhesive and you could erase off or scratch off lighten up um the ink yeah right okay and 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 you know you could conceivably do something with that like that with an array uh, with a razor blade but it would just take you forever to do with a razor blade and it would be fairly easy to do with a piece of sandpaper or a really gritty eraser so that's more likely yeah and but there, so there are people who do i've seen artists we'll look at a, some of them um, it, definitely in other videos, but there are some people who do get the razor and they almost like draw into the tone pattern, like right. match into it. So that's another look I've seen, but this faded look, I haven't seen as much. So I do wonder if there was some of that here uh -huh. intentionally. I don't, I think it's just the degradation you're talking about, but it's interesting to compare because you could see someone intentionally going through and erasing to create this sparkly water effect. Right. Um, so I don't know. It, it just sucks to not have access to the original art. When we talk about Cerebus, uh, we'll be able to see some of the things that Gerhard did with Tone, uh, which are fairly <laughs> wild, like when uh, the Jaka story sequencer, he used a bunch of um, white paint on top of it and he watered it down <laughs> to make a gradation. I'll sh show you guys the color originals for that. Yeah, when we talk about Cerebus, and uh, for people who don't know, Sean spent a number of years restoring and helping Dave Sim reprint Cerebus. So those books, we have access to everything. And yeah. Sean can explain very thoroughly. So those will probably be huge videos. <laughs> um, Sean will also do some some just um, educational, like how-to videos, we hope eventually for the channel on, on art restoration and, and preparing art, you know, even if you have good quality art, how to do it right. So, um something interesting happens after that story and something so, that seems so personal all of a sudden we've got um, a few stories that were uh, remakes of stories that he drew for the book market in the late 50s um, and uh, it, it's an interesting reading it if you don't know that it can be a little bit jarring like what the hell he's going back to the uh, ninja the stuff now? samurai stuff yeah <laughs> but he's brought with him the new design skills. oh yeah absolutely uh, so panels like this 
um and going back you'll see there's this lady ninja so going back to those um sampai shirado images i, I mm -hmm. found those queued up still you know looking at these images you can see and especially there's a page i want to look at in just a second here that has this this structure to it which is really interesting so you to me i see him within a year become a much more sophisticated composer and sort of here's actually something i just noticed look at this there's this tangent that runs through here yeah <laughs> so the line of the bow and the line of the wall are perfectly lined up across panels and that creates motion across the panel normally you would say avoid a tangent because it confuses space but when you have a a kind of a line that seems to move across panels, you can create a meta composition. Um, you're not just making a successful composition here, but you're composing in a way that the two things lock in together. So I just noticed that I hadn't noticed that on reading it, but there's nice another thing about just sitting around and chatting. Right. There's okay. another one with that black space, the negative black space on the panel below. Um, you see it lead into the arm above. I mean, that, that's not so much of a, a as a directional element, but um, just as a sort of compositional element he could have had chose to have that balloon break up the background anywhere he wants but he's fitted it into the arm shape above right there right here yeah, yeah. and so that's interesting it, it, it creates um a sense of unity and harmony between the panels this i find really weird i'm not used to seeing that in manga i don't know if it's just because it's in the lettering yeah the typesetting uh, is a little yeah disturbing. by the way there was there was a page because i do really want to talk about lettering and translation, um, especially on um, the work of Ennio Asano, who does it really well. This one, I feel in this letter one, I feel like they just hacked this out. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, I got to be critical of that. Yeah. Uh, and, and the fade, the fade to get you to like pay attention yeah. to the part they want you to pay attention to. Not a fan of that. I don't know how that looked in the original, um, but I'm very interested in a lot of the newer artists that are working almost primarily digitally, I'm, I'm seeing examples of they know that their work is going to be translated. And I'm almost positive they're working on layers where it's really easy to just strip out the lettering and the, the English publishers can redo it without having to redraw artwork and stuff. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of the newer stuff have really sophisticated, beautiful lettering that's more difficult to pull off in one like this where you have to re potentially recreate artwork or something. But I that that did really bother me. Um, but this is really interesting. I'm not used to seeing that. This looks very uh, American autobiographical comic type of stuff to me. Right. Beautiful designs, like just pure, like negative, positive space silhouettes. Um, this was the page. Oh, wait, no. More design stuff I feel is beautiful. Uh, here's some more people jumping. I thought this one was really awesome. Um, this, this whole story, you can see the style is a pretty clean cartoony style. And, and so when he gets to these gory moments, they're extra shocking to me. This one, I actually, I think I said, oh shit out loud. Like which <laughs> it's, there's only one other comic that I've done that to. Um, so like, they're fighting and his hand gets cut off and you assume that's the only hand that gets cut off. But then you get over here and you realize the cut's been made on his other arm. So he grabs the tree and it just rips off. And just that splatter effect in that moment, I, that was so disgusting to me because um, it was just so shocking. And yeah. then here with the head cut off, popping off as it hits the ground, like against all of this more beautiful, just cartoony stuff is... I think that's sophisticated. Um, this was the one. Yeah, 201. So yeah. comparing that to going back to what he tried to do very early on with this page of this guy jumping around the tree where I said it, I got very confused about which order to read in. This one's wonderful because he creates this meta composition again that just circles and this character keeps running. So you get the sense that this kid's been out here playing like that for a while um, and then his mom comes and you know kind of interrupts him but e even there that that's uh it's just so, so much more sophisticated and then that it, it's perfect because that image you sent over of senpai shirado has that same kind of loopy structure in the meta composition right. 
Uh, so it's really interesting to see. And, and though the, the Suge one we're looking at is about a lady ninja. And this kind of has, well, she's not a ninja, but it's like a mother and child and all these ninja samurai stories. So this last one does feel like it loops back around to that influence. Quite well, not the last one, but this right. this later one loops back around. Um, and then this image, this was the other one I wanted to talk about. This this was what, what did you, what does it say, 60, 66? 66, but um, but what it would have been originally drawn in 59, uh, okay. I believe, or 60. Okay. This is, uh, like I said, I, I, throughout the book, I continued to see his influences from Western society and especially Western modernism in, in both art and design. As soon as I saw this, uh, I immediately thought of, uh, it took me a while to figure it out, which is embarrassing because I teach graphic design <laughs> at Shelton State, and this is one of the pieces we talk about. But I immediately thought of The Man with the Golden Arm by Saul Bass. It just took me a second to remember the, the name of the movie. But if you compare like that image to right. what we what we have on the oh, page. Oh, yeah. Jeez. <laughs> it's like the same thing. Um, that piece, the reason I'm always talking about it in graphic design is it was one of the first times, if I remember correct, that there was an identity system created for a film so that this symbol was on the poster. And then I'll show a video real quick. It was in, it, it, they basically created, like you would create uh, the Nike swoosh for Nike or something. You create a corporate identity system. They created an identity system for the advertising of the film. And that showed up. Um, can you see the video that I'm playing yeah. here? Yep. Does that show? That yep. showed up in the title credits of the film. They have this animated um, sequence here that had the look of the identity system they were using and then it comes out into that hand right at mm -hmm. the end um, so it's an important piece of graphic design history and it was obviously had to have been super influential and that's 1955 yeah um, so I have a really hard time not seeing that influence and you can see going back to like the uh, the the unusual painting story and a lot of the things I'm talking about where you have this abstract non-representational modernist design, which is super European. And then it, in the, here it's now become more of a New York thing. Um, he seems super highly influenced by that to me. That, that was one of the biggest things I noticed while I was reading this book is the influence of Western ab abstraction and, and modernist design. Well, and, and the, these later stories, these ones that were drawn earlier and then re remade, um, they were originally drawn in the uh, late fifties. And the, like I said, the, under the banner of Gekiga of basically like tough comics. And all of those comics were very, very influenced by crime novels, crime movies, uh, and sort of you, you get a lot, you got a lot of cross pollination because one of the entertainments that people could have in a post war economically depressed Japan was go to the movie theater um, and get second run American movies. So, I mean, it is very likely that uh, Suge went to a theater and saw the man with the golden arm and, you know, paid a few yen to sit in a dark room and and watch it you know spool off uh, on a screen and uh, i'm really interested actually i should have looked this up but i wonder if the man with the golden arm has like a handcuff thing in it yeah that's a good question that's a that's a common like crime motif uh crime theme motif for obvious reasons <laughs> but uh one of the um few suge or uh, one of the few uh, tatsumi books that is available that he made for the book market in the 50s is also a story about a criminal um and a uh, policeman chain or a oh we lost you there you glitched out but that chain was a common motif. It sounds like, uh, I'm looking at the, I don't know. We lost Sean there. This is a problem about not being in the same room. Um, looking up the man with the golden arm. That's not part of the plot there. There we go. Sean's back. We, uh, need to unmute yourself. 
this uh these character designs right here are super 50 1950s <laughs> all of a sudden everybody has on you know the 50 shoes and uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that would have been i don't know another book that we definitely need to look at is barefoot gin i know you're like don't even yeah. want to re-expose yourself to that <laughs> but um a lot of a lot of elements of that kind of stuff like the gangster culture in japan that comes out of um after you know after hiroshima has been and nagasaki have been bombed and people are left homeless and destitute and the government's changing over from the imperial rule to like the united states coming in and you know kind of running the game for a while um that's all captured in barefoot gin which is a, like a devastating devastating manga that i don't think gets enough play you yeah. know um so that's something we'll have to look at at, at at some point in time. They're also beautifully reprinted, the, the ones I have at least. Great. Um, the ones so I have are terrible. So I'm looking forward to seeing the contrast. It'll be interesting to have scans of both of them then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that was a lot of fun to talk about. Um, I hope that you guys will pick up this particular book because it is, um, in my estimation, Anyway, this is the type of publication that people should be, re, you know, rewarding. It's a rewarding read. Um, it's a it's a daring thing for them to start uh, at the period that they did, because I think that this will get, you know, it. if you're not doing the legwork to know what the background is on some of these stories, I think that um, it's easy to sort of see the genre elements and miss the unique stuff that's happening with it. Um, but um, as you get into later period, I mean, it's just a incredible contrast. So they've got another volume coming out. Um, Red Flowers is coming out, I think in a month or two. Oh, okay, cool. And it's easy to, it's easy to be a little thrown off by the unevenness of the, the type of stories. Like that caught me off guard. It was like, right. like well, I really like these ones and these ones just seem silly. So why why am i having these two but i get that they're doing kind of a historical thing so that like with your input on that 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 was much more interesting to me yeah i'm pretty sure this is intended to be a com uh, a complete uh all of his short story work from what they're calling his modern period so they're not going to go back earlier than this presumably unless it's a huge success so um carson can i see your face again are you uh, able to uh yeah, I'm just gonna have to do the dizzy camera thing here because I lost. There we go. Hey, <laughs> I had to resort to one camera there. <laughs> the other, the other one got hot. Uh, it looks like. Um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for sticking around, watching the video. Um, definitely give the channel a subscribe if you like this type of content. We're going to be looking at a lot, lot of different kinds of art. I mean, obviously, uh, we're interested in a lot of manga, but there's a lot of European and American artists we like to get to. Mm -hmm. um, give the video a like, and then especially give us feedback. What about this do you like? What do you want to see more of? What do you, what do you want to see less of? If there's certain um, books that you think we should take a look at, like I'd love to hear what you guys recommend. I'd also love to hear if there's information you guys know about this stuff that we don't you know um any of that kind of stuff in the comments would be awesome and now me and sean are gonna go get set up to do some drawing i think and we're gonna record a yeah. second video well thanks for listening guys have a good one